research. Um, and yeah, excited to meet everyone and thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, Alamed? Hi, everyone. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. So it's a pleasure to meet all of you. So I'm a PhD student in GIS, Geographic Information Science, near Arizona State University. So I'm a first year PhD student. Yeah. Thank you. Greg? Hi, good, good afternoon. Good morning, depending on when you are. Uh, Greg Emman, Associate Director for Geospatial Applications at Season. As Kit mentioned, I work with him on the COPS project and my background is geography GIS. Nice to meet you all. Thanks. Uh, Linda, you just want to introduce you and the others in the room? Sure. Thanks, Kit. Um, I'm Linda Pistolesi. It's really nice to finally have faces for everybody that I've been emailing with. Um, I'm a GIS specialist at Season. Um, working with Kit and the team on this TOPS project. And I'll pass over to Camilla. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Camilla Green. I'm a research staff assistant at Season, working on the school project. Hi, I'm Josie Morgan. I'm also a research staff assistant at Season, also working on the TOPS project. Cool. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, you know, I think it's always important to to take time to say, say who we are. And, you know, I'm really excited to, to hear more about each of you and the work you're doing. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple minutes here to give an overview of the, of the project that we're working on, uh, which is called the, the Science Core Heuristics for Open Science Outcomes and Learning or the, the school project. Uh, this project, just please note, as you're all aware now that we are recording the meeting, but I think it's important just to make everyone aware again. Uh, we do have a code of conduct from the NASA TOPS program that we, we try to practice in all of our meetings where, you know, we're good listeners. We participate in an authentic and active way. You know, we want to exercise respect for one another and we encourage people to listen as much as they speak, you know, I, many good moral things in this code of conduct. And at the beginning of every one of our meetings, we start out by displaying a code of conduct. Uh, so you may be wondering what is NASA TOPS? Uh, TOPS, it stands for the Transform to Open Science mission. And it, the TOPS mission is focused on empowering researchers and communities to use open science as a catalyst for positive change. Uh, NASA has made a commitment to this work, uh, you know, a five-year commitment, actually, then we're in the beginning of year two right now, with the idea that open science is going to help us to accelerate major scientific discoveries, to broaden participation, and to increase the understanding and adoption of open science in for researchers. So how does TOPS conceive of what open science means? Uh, the diagram here on the screen, it really encapsulate it. So, you know, open science is science that's accessible. And it, that doesn't just mean that you can go somewhere and download it. It means that it's communicated in a way that's accessible for people to understand. Uh, it's inclusive in that it brings not only the people who have been experts for 20 or 30 years on a subject into the conversation, but we want to bring in new perspectives from groups that historically may not have been part of scientific processes. And it, it's reproducible in that it uses open frameworks that are well documented and agreed upon and uh, uses environments and demonstrates those environments in ways that other people can reproduce. So there's this idea that, uh, you know, one of the primary project scientists in the TOPS program, Shell Gentman, has articulated really well. It's this idea that we need more people, more hands, more eyes, more brains with different experiences so that we can find the best solutions. You know, here we are as the world we're, we're, we're facing, you know, this emerging climate crisis, and it's going to take everyone on deck to come up with the best solutions. So open science is, you know, a way for us to make things more accessible and more inclusive for others to, to help solve these, these wicked problems. 
Uh, so one of the major things that TOPS has produced in their first year is a series of online learning modules called OpenCore. Uh, there's a link to Open Science 101 in the that uh, Linda, maybe you could help add that to the chat as well. Uh, but it's these five online learning modules that talk about open data, open software, open tools and resources. And, you know, even though I've been working in this space for quite a long time, I'd gone through these MOOCs and I, I learned a lot of new things. Uh, so it, definitely whether whether you're new to the game or whether you're someone who's been a professional for a while, uh, taking these courses will be really helpful to learn about things like how to write a good data management plan for a NASA proposal. Uh, so I really want to encourage everyone to take the time to go through these as it certainly will will help you in your career down the road. Uh, so our project is an offshoot of Open Core. It's called the Science Core, uh, which Open Core was a general overview of what open science is, whereas Science Core is more domain specific. Um, there are 10 different groups that received awards for curriculum development, you know, focusing on planetary science, but also on the earth sciences. Uh, you know, ourselves and a couple other groups are focusing on earth science domains. Uh, so again, our, pro our project is called School. What, it, what is the school project really about? Our objective is to develop curriculum that incorporates NASA data and applications into demonstrations of the, the data science life cycle. I'll describe what the data science life cycle means in a second. But there'll be several online learning modules that focus on varying themes from NASA Earth Sciences, like water resources, health and air quality, environmental justice, disasters and wildfires, and agriculture and climate. Uh, our expertise, many of the folks on our team, our background is in socioeconomic data. So although we're looking at the these traditionally hard science domains in the earth science division, within each of them, population and infrastructure is something that we're weaving in to our lesson plans, you know, drawing on our own backgrounds and expertise. So I mentioned the data science life cycle. Uh, here it is in a graphic, you know, it starts with the either the, the acquisition of data, either through ge generation or collection, you know, we'll have lessons that look at how do you process and store that data, either locally or in the cloud. Uh, we'll do work on managing and analyzing the data, some of these pre-processing that you might do to a data set or statistical techniques you might apply to make adjustments or normalizations. Uh, part of it will focus on visualizing and interpreting those analysis results. And then finally, how do we engage our results in an open science friendly way to, to get it out in the, the community? Uh, we do have an agile project management structure, which just to boil this down, you know, you could I could talk for an hour just about this, but to boil it down, it means that we, in this two year project, as we develop a new module, we release it. Uh, so it does, it's not that we wait until the end of the project and then release everything. It's like as things are becoming available, they're also being released for feedback. Uh, this is just a list of the folks who are on our team. Uh, many of them are here today, but some of them couldn't make it. Uh, many of us, again, were at season at Columbia University, but we also have partners at iSciences LLC, which is a private group with extensive expertise in open science practices, and at the City University of New York Institute for Demographic Research, or CUNY CIDR. So the, the first module we focused on was on water resources. And uh, you know this table has the three data sets that we looked at in depth. Uh, I realize we don't have a lot of time, so I, I'm not going to spend too much time describing these things, but I will. we will share all the materials afterward. 
Technically, you know, our, our deliverables are things like Jupyter notebooks or Quarta notebooks. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're investigating the best ways to make that available as online interactive code. In particular, there's a there's a group called 2i2c that has implemented a number of Jupyter hubs for NASA and other groups who we're, we're working closely with. Um, maybe some of you have heard of the Binder project, uh, mybinder.org. Uh, the folks at 2ITC, they, they've worked closely on the Binder project and what they're, they're do, trying to help us out with is to provide bigger binders or you know, these online browser-based executable code repositories that have more RAM and more memory uh, for because some of the data sets we're working with are, are quite large. So our recent milestones is, you know, we have run some workshops at the NSF iGUIDE forum uh, where we learned from water module or subject matter experts in water resources. Uh, practicing what we preach, we have established uh, Zenodo community and a YouTube channel where we make all of our materials available. And to, to the extent possible, we we encourage hybrid open meetings where you know anyone could join and, and listen in. Uh, we have established also an open science team, which is a team of largely volunteers from you know undergraduate students to professionals who are providing us with early feedback on the module as we are developing. Uh, so we're in that process right now where, where the open science team is reviewing our, our beta website and our, our beta water module. Uh, which I guess if Zoom will cooperate with me, uh, just to, to show a look at at the website itself it's you know it's it's still under construction but we have information there about activities that we've undertaken uh, you know including this panel session that we'll we'll be doing in a couple weeks at AAG uh you know i think one thing that's important is that if someone contributes to open science they deserve to get credit for that uh so we have our our school yearbook where open science team members and subject matter experts can get a bit more credit for their contributions to the project. Also, when we post something on Zenodo, we can list everyone as authors in that. So it's nice that you get a citation to Zenodo where we're listed as an author. It's an, another way to give people the credit that they deserve for contributing to this work. Uh, Here's a framework of the water module. You know, I'm not going to go through much of it right now, but we'll, we'll share the links. But we see we have a couple of different lessons here looking at historic flood data, near real-time data, and then on water quality, looking at lead in, in schools in New York. <clears throat> so that's where we've been. Uh, you know, where are we going and why are we convened today? Uh, our, our next modules are going to be on health and air quality and environmental justice. So in the original proposal, we, we described a couple of data sets that we, we may end up using. Uh, we're also open to, you know, hearing feedback from you and others about if there could be better data sets or better approaches to use. Uh, so for health and air quality, we're looking again at some near real time data and then some historic data. Uh, for environmental justice, we have some data that's historic and based on, you know, vulnerability indexes. There's a global data set that is a relative deprivation index, which we think is a, is a proxy for poverty. And then the, the EJ screen tool, I think it, it's very possible, popular these days uh, for identifying communities in the U.S. that... Uh, you know, our priority community. So I want to thank you all for helping us to kick off these modules on health and air quality and environmental justice. Uh, with that, you know, I'll, I'll open for questions and then hand it off 
to hear a bit from you guys. So it's, does anyone have any questions? Okay, so that's a good indication. My presentation was either very clear or it, no one was paying attention. <laughs> I know you you were all paying attention. So I can see, if, at, at least uh, I think back when I, the pandemic hit and we were teaching on Zoom and it was hard to know, or even being back in person, people had masks on, but you know now we see, see faces and expressions. I think it, it's a lot of engagement there. Uh, so with that, we, we didn't set an order of the presentations, but if it's okay, I'll, I'll go in reverse order from where we started and I could ask Alamin to start us off. Uh, so I'll stop share. And uh, again, uh, you know, if you don't have slides, that's, that's totally fine. I just want to hear a bit about your work and uh, um, I think. I have the slide, the folder you shared with us. So I uploaded over there. So do you think you can share that or I should bring that out? Like uh, I have the slides. I can I can pull them up and share them, all I mean, And you can just tell okay. me when yeah. to forward. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, it's Great. good. Give me a second. Yeah. yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, should I go? Yes. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much again for having me. So it's a uh, really pleasure to meet all of you over here. So here I wanted to give some, uh, I mean, the introduction for the work what I'm currently doing and my some of my previous work. So can you go in the next place? Yeah, currently I'm a PhD student in GI science in Arizona State University. So uh, Dr. David Solar and Dr. Aaron Forrest as my advisor. So previously I have two masters on in geoinformatics and geospatial intelligence from George Mason University. And then I also have a master's in geography from Bavon University. And I got my bachelor for back in Bangladesh from Kola University on urban and rural planning. Can you go next? Next please. So basically I work on the urban issues of, uh, currently I'm working on a project is a department of energy funded project is called Southwest Urban Integrated Urban Field Corridor Laboratory. So this work is, is a multi, I mean, the institutional project like University of Arizona, Northern Arizona University, IBM, Oak Ridge National Laboratory and other one of the labs are collaborating in this research project. So, uh, 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 this is my actual second semester of the uh, project I'm working on. So I focus on some of the, I mean, the uh, urban issues like air quality and uh, urban, urban heat island aspects in my research area. So currently I'm working on a project where we are actually focusing on how, I mean, the socioeconomic demographic factors can actually influence access to air quality information in Maricopa County, Arizona. This, uh, I mean, the, this area is, I mean, one of the fastest growing and diverse in terms of demography and population status. So previous, some of the studies like uh, of, of focus on the, uh, I mean, the Los Angeles County in California, they have actually seen that based on the, the socioeconomic and demographic status, some of the people actually, they don't have the, the crucial air quality information because they are not in the, in the, in the census track, which actually have the census coverage. So we actually wanted to see that what's happening over here in our Maricopa County. So yeah, we are focusing on one of the most popular, I mean, the low cost air quality sensor in the purple air sensor. And then we want to see that the, how the EPA standard sensor and the low cost sensor actually can combine and can actually can see that how is on is complement to another to get the, I mean, the air quality information coverage for all the people in our study area. Can you go please next, please? Yeah, uh, as I, I I was just saying, so initial uh, some of the uh, I mean the objective of our research is actually see the special distribution of the ease of the ease of the sensor, governmental as well as low quality air quality sensor, and then actually using the statistical modeling uh, to you uh, and the other explainable variable like the 
socioeconomic status, income, and the ethnicity, the other as a factor, so that we can is it actually can they can actually potentially explain that the variation in the access to air quality information. Can you go next, please? Yeah, these are some of the research. It's not much related to the current research. I mean, the uh, the uh, research I will be focusing on in the, the ALZ discussion. Some of the works I did uh, on the urban like the uh, precipitation as well as uh, stormwater management in urban areas. Can you go next, please? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I think there is nothing too much discuss about that. This is the uh, just my previous, I mean, the work, I mean, the professional experience. I, I was involved in that. Can you go next, please? Yeah, uh, I have uh, received uh, some of the funding uh, of uh, to attend the ASZ conference, like the GPSA funding, as well as. Uh, our department of funding. And currently I'm also mentoring a, a high school student for his uh, the school project on urban heat island. Can you go next please? Yeah, previously I served in a couple of the um, committees such as the program representative uh, in the George Mason University as well as board member for International Society uh, Student Advisory Board in George Mason University. So in this uh, ASG session in this year, I'm going to uh, I mean the Aaron's as well as co-chair to the to uh, a session, and as well as I'll be the discussion for this panel discussion. Can you go next, please? Yeah, thank you. Just a short introduction of me. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's a, impressive the amount of work that that you've accomplished already, and uh, you know, it'd be great to continue to discuss it at AIG in a few weeks. Uh, so again, going in backwards order from where I went before, Kayla is. Uh... Yeah, great. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Hope it, oh, would someone mind giving me permission to share my screen? I wasn't able to upload my slides, um, so I apologize. Yeah, no worries. Okay, cool. Um... Can you try now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Are you seeing the notes or the? Uh, see the notes. Okay. Um, uh, now. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, hi everyone. Again, thank you so much. Um, for having me on this panel. My name is Kayla and I'm a fourth year PhD student in Community Research and Action, um, which is located within the Department of Human and Organizational Development at Vanderbilt University. Um, so I kind of wanted to give some background on how I got here because I think that is really telling of the type of research I do. So I'm originally from Washington State and I went to a small private liberal arts college um, and majored in sociology, um, but furthering getting um, a PhD was never the original plan. Um, I originally was a middle school teacher for a couple years in South Carolina and then worked at a youth serving nonprofit. So really was focusing on youth engagement. Um, but I realized that I needed to get a master's degree if I was going to move up in the nonprofit sector. Um, so I went to Vanderbilt and got a professional degree in community development in action um, which during that time realized I loved research and wanted to pursue that and loved the opportunities to get to mentor and work um, with undergrads and high schoolers. And so um, decided to stay at Vanderbilt to get my PhD um, because of the nature of the program. Um, our program really focuses on community-based research and participatory research methods uh, with students uh, researching topics from child development and human development to education to environmental issues, um, which is something that I study. Um, so my research interests are really first led by community-based participatory action research approaches. Um, I am really committed to engaging with community members in order to answer their research questions to prompt social change, um, and especially working with young people in the context of Nashville. Um, I also typically deploy qualitative and geospatial methods. Um, and then my research topics are really focusing kind of on the intersection of environmental justice, community organizing, and these um, like psychosocial outcomes of community power. 
or an empowerment processes. Um, so this work, these um, methods and interests really show up in some of the projects that I'm involved in, which seem very different from one another, but I think they all kind of relate back to this idea of environmental justice and creating healthy spaces where people live, work, play, and pray. Um, and so the first uh, project that is the topic of my dissertation is the Grundy County Environmental Justice Project. Um, so this is what I'm also presenting on at AAG, but it's a participatory action research project working with community members in a rural Appalachian County in Tennessee to explore environmental health concerns um, that community members have identified. Um, they're specifically concerned about perceived heightened risk of cancers, um, but also since we've gotten involved, they've also become concerned about unwanted land uses and how that impacts um, their ability to control and have a say over the places they call home. Um, another project that I'm really heavily involved with is called the Nashville Youth Design Team, and it's a youth participatory action research project where we work with 15 high school students from across um, Nashville, Davidson County to explore what do young people need to be healthy and well. Um, so really focusing on the urban built environment. We recently worked on a project called the Dream City Workshop where we worked with kids between the ages of five and 18 to imagine their dream city, um, which that means there's no limit to um, the possibilities. There could be flying cars, chocolate fountains, things like that, um, to understand what would a world look like if it was designed for young people. Um, I'm also part of the Vanderbilt Drinking Water Justice Lab. And so uh, my geospatial work really comes out. I am working with a team to construct the U.S. Community Water Systems Estimated Service Area Boundaries Database, um, which will allow us to be able to do community water system level analysis on drinking water violations and compare that to sociodemographics to look at potential disparities between drinking water service. And then kind of a fun side project because I live in Nashville, which is the bachelorette capital of the United States, um, I've become really passionate about how short-term rentals impact community cohesion and sense of place within the city. Um, so I wanted to, before closing, just to provide you with a little bit more detail on what my dissertation research is focusing on um, in the Grundy County project. Um, so it's collective action around perceived environmental and environmental health concerns in Grundy County, Tennessee. Grundy County is a predominantly white, non-Hispanic rural community. And so trying to unpack and understand how they frame and perceive environmental health concerns within a U.S. Um, socio-political context. Um, so using participatory action research and using interviews, focus groups, participant observation, and then social media, which I think has been the most interesting to understand how people um, have discourse around environmental justice concerns um, over the internet um, and using terms that may not necessarily be environmental justice, but that's what they're talking about in other words. So thinking about how to frame that, how to kind of frame environmental justice within rural communities um, with the current polarization of political um, parties within the United States and the politicization of environmental and climate change. Um, yeah, so thank you all so much for having me and um, I'm excited to get to meet the rest of you. Yeah, awesome, Kayla. I, I think that, you know, we, there's a lot of overlap in some of the research that we're doing. Uh, so I look forward to being able to discuss that more. Uh, next was Ben. Yeah, thanks, everybody. It's really interesting to hear about your guys' work. Um, Kit, I did have a question that occurred to me about your presentation. So so in our institution, and maybe your guys' as, as well, there's been this push the last couple of years for open educational resources, OER, in the classroom when we're designing our curriculum. Just wondered if you're, if the school project has any connection with that, with designing uh, a kind of college curriculum that's open access. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, not precisely in the terms of OER, although I'd like, I'd really like to talk more with you about that. Uh, but our our deliverables at the end of the day will be Git GitHub repositories that are open access. Uh, you know, we're working on a supplement to create some additional materials to help 
teachers to bring it into their classroom. Uh, but we, we haven't used the term OER specifically, although may, maybe we could, there's still room for us to, to move in that direction. So thanks for the question. Well, yeah, well, the project sounds, sounds really interesting, really, really cool. Um, all right, I, didn't, I don't have any slides, so I'm just going to speak um, to you guys directly here. Uh, I'm Ben Crawford. I'm faculty. I'm assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Denver. Um, I, most of my grad work at University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and my background really is in, is in urban climate, so how, how cities and urbanization affect weather and climate on pretty small scales. So I've done a lot of things with greenhouse gas emissions, things like the urban heat island, uh, green infrastructure, and, and also air quality and air pollution. Um, I'm, a, I'm kind of a physical geographer, so I like to, to get out in the field. I mostly work with, with measurements and instruments and sensors to collect data and then work with, with that data. Um, I've, I've had a project since 2018 in I'm looking at um, air pollution from Kilauea. Um, and we, the approach we took to measure that was to use kind of these new generation of low cost air quality sensors. And in the air pollution world, these sensors have really been able to revolutionize um, how we measure and think about um, air quality and exposure. So this project in Hawaii in 2018, we were invited to the Big Island to help assist with air quality monitoring during the big eruption that happened in that, that summer in 2018. Um, so we we're really interested in um, VOG, so volcanic smog, that's what, that's what it's called there. Uh, we're interested in the, the chemistry of the, the, the plume, the volcanic plume. So we wanted to know how this plume chemically changes and, and how people are exposed to different levels of air pollution at different locations. And so as part of this project, we also had a really extensive outreach and education program. Um, so most of our sensors were located at schools and we worked a lot with teachers to help them think of ways to incorporate these sensors and the data in, into, their, into their curriculum. And um, so we learned a lot. It was, it was a lot of fun. And it was a really, I say, I think, really a place-based kind of program. Um, so that's still ongoing. And we still have sensors up in Hawaii. And, and I'll be talking more about that at the AAG conference. Um, let's see what else I've got. So I've got a couple of air pollution projects happening right now. So I've got the Hawaii project going on and then another one looking at networks of low cost air quality sensors um, to, to look at air pollution during natural disasters. So mostly wildfires and also volcanic eruptions and, and possibly conflict as well if we can, if we can find the data. Um, then I also have, and she's gonna have a couple of heat focused studies working look, mostly in Denver. So uh, one's about urban heat and cool roofs. So ways we can mitigate heat. And then also uh, one that's just starting up this summer, looking at heat disparities around transit stations uh, and bus stops in Denver and what implications are for, for exposure and equity. Um, yeah, so that's what, I, that's what I do and looking forward to getting to know more about what you guys do and, and this panel. Yeah, it's, it's it's really exciting. Uh, you know, I've been involved in some analogous work in New York with some you know purple air sensors and Atmo Tube Pro, uh, yeah. which is like a mo mobile sensor. Uh, yeah, no, I we definitely should talk more offline about areas of overlap. It's very exciting. Cool. Yeah, uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, so D Dingy. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm going to share my slide. Oh, sorry. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for having me here today. So my name is Ding Yi Niu. I'm a graduate student studying urban regional planning at UH University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm also a graduate assistant working at the Hawaii Sea Grant. So it's also part of the National Sea Grant. So uh, I relocated uh, from China to Hawaii for college in 2018. So I studied uh, environmental science when I was undergrad. Uh, during my study in undergrad, I realized 
environmental issue is actually a planning issue. So a reasonable planning can help to solve a lot of environmental problems. That's why I uh, continue my study in urban regional planning for master. Yeah, so this is uh, an uh, image of uh, the University of Hawaii at Manoa campus. And so it's, it, this is a photo like, taken in the mountain behind our campus. Uh, so uh, currently I'm working on a project called uh, Puanoa Environmental Justice Project. Uh, so Puanoa is also known as Pearl Harbor. So everyone knows where it's at. And also I'm working on um, urban form and micro mobility project. So uh, this project I'll focus on um, how the zoning code impact the micro mobility that is uh, bicycle, bicycling, scootering, and uh, walking. And in the past, I have engaged into Resilience Hub project. So Resilience Hub is a community-based place that can support uh, communities uh, during a disaster or during uh, normal days. So they can support uh, communities with food, energies, clean water, and uh, maybe a community meetings, workshops, they can work hold, um, hold, uh, in the resilience hubs. And before that, I'm also um, have a research on the ordinary and the climate change adaptation. Uh, I look at the how the sea level rise will impact the ordinary's life, especially their accessibility to uh, to uh, grocery shopping and to the hospital clinic. So yeah, I I found there is uh, actually the signal rise will have a large impact to the ordinary's life, especially in the uh, during the emergency, they might take more time to access to the emergency services. Uh, but I just want to uh, take maybe one or two minutes to talk talk more about the uh, Puno Environmental Justice pro Project. So, uh, so this area is known as Pearl Harbor. So uh, from this slide, you can see the pre-colonialism and uh, today, how the landscape change in these areas, uh, especially in the, re the most recent 200 years, those commercial uh, farming and the military activities has changed those areas a lot. So those commercial farming and the military activities uh, make those areas very polluted. And um, until today, there's a lot of uh, social vulnerability. There's a, a lot of vulnerable population needs there. So make these places is uh, extremely vulnerable. So yeah, I'll I'll talk this. I have a presentation on this and AAG. So yeah, and yeah, and uh, see you all in Hawaii. And if you guys need any help when during your visiting Hawaii, please let me know. And, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Ningyi. Uh, I think that you know it's really interesting work. Uh, I've done some work with New York Sea Grant in the past, uh, so it'd be interesting to, to to talk about how things are with the Sea Grant office that you're working with as well. Uh, next would be Destiny. Okay, let me try to see if I can share my screen. All right, can I you can, all see that? I can see it. All right. Um, aloha kako o Destiny Mapumai ke aloha apilado ko'u inoa. Um, hi all, my name is Destiny Mapumai ke aloha apilado. I'm excited to introduce myself to all you guys and start off with like a little picture of me holding a pig. <laughs> um, um, usually in Hawaii, we start our introductions um, with the place that we come from. So 
excited to also introduce myself with Oahu, the island that we'll all be meeting on. Um, this is where I grew up, where I was born and spent virtually all of my life. And it's a huge part of who I am. Um, and one place in particular I want to highlight on the windward side of Oahu is Ahupua'a of Kahalu'u, which is a place very special to me because it's where I get to practice my cultural, um, my, practice my culture. Um, so you can see some awesome photos there of what it looks like in the um, up in the Malka or up in the mountains. You can look out into the Kaneohe Bay. Um, my uncle has a farm in this area where we get to um, garden. We get to practice kuiai, which is the practice of pounding taro into poi, which is a a, a staple food for Native Hawaiians. Um, we also get to collect lay material in the mountains to make garlands um, and make underground emus with kids, um, kiki. Um, and this is where we kind of cook our food in, in the underground ovens. And you can see in the top, bottom left corner, there's a child there um, digging up the biochar from the emu, which we use as a soil amendment in our gardens to also make food to feed our communities. Going into some more um, formal stuff, my educational background is a little bit of a weird path I took, but I started off my education getting an associate's in natural sciences from Lee River Community College and graduated in 2019, where I had amazing mentors who gave me opportunities to study protein expression, um, plasmid constructs for vaccine research. And I also worked in the molecular biology lab and was also tutored organic chemistry. So um, biochemistry was actually my first love and it was kind of a past life for me, but it is a you know a big part of my academic past. Um, and then so after Libra Community College, I transferred to UH Manoa and graduated in 2021 with a bachelor's of science in biochemistry. Not too much photos here because this is during COVID. Um, so a lot of my later undergrad was spent behind the computer screen, <laughs> hence um, an informal graduation on the beach with my cap and gown. <laughs> and then I don't have it um, pictured here, but after my undergrad, I spent a gap year working on a farm and I met one of my mentors today who encouraged me to do a master's in environmental management. And that's what I've been working on the past two years and we'll be graduating in May. So that's very exciting. Um, the lab that I'm a part of is a soil health lab. So what they do is looking at the health of soils in Hawaii and the different um, agricultural practices that are used here and understanding the, the dynamics um, specifically for Hawaii soils because it is a very diverse soil in Hawaii compared to anywhere else in the US. You'll find 11 of the 12 different soil series in just like a small portion of the land here, which is unheard of in anywhere else in the continent. Um, and going into more about my current work, my project, my master's work um, titled Informing Place-Based Equity for Hawaii's Local Producers. Um, it's more of a social science um, research looking at agriculture, um, including participatory um, research, traditional food systems and policy. Um, and I could talk about hours about this work because it's been my baby for the last two years, but essentially I could boil it down to it's um, setting the barriers that local farmers in Hawaii face to having access to grants, loans, incentives, and other um, financial resources provided by the USDA. Um, and um, I guess I could say this work is really focusing on doing participatory research and recognizing the local land practices here. For example, a lot of the native Hawaiian practices aren't recognized as conservation practices under like the USDA NRCS. And so those practices may not be um, able to receive grants to um, apply those practices that have been historically shown to do really well in Hawaii, promote soil health, and um, you know, improve food security because I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but the food security in Hawaii is very um, on a it's walking on a on a uh, on the edge there, with 98% of our food being imported, um, which is scary. It takes just one natural disaster to destroy our ports, and having seven days of food locally. Um, is really scary. So that's kind of the basis of my research. And what I really like to do is um, make it participatory, looking to community as experts, looking to those folks and working and engaging with those guys to be able to understand their practices. 
um, and being able to recognize it and um, informing how policy should be changed in order to give these people more access to the resources that they need to be successful with their practices in Hawaii. Um, going into a little more informal stuff, so my obsessions, um, kui ai, which is, a, I think I said earlier, pounding poi or pounding the call or taro into a poi. Um, I also love farming, working on a farm is what I try to find to do to do in all of my spare time. I am also obsessed with flowers throughout my undergrad. I worked with a floral designer and made flower arrangements, making people smile through flowers. And I love also working in the lo'ikalo, which is a flooded system that taro is um, grown in. In this picture behind us in the top photo, you can see that's actually what the area looks like before it's been planted in. And um, I just love food and having a relationship with my food from when it's in the ground to processing processing it through kuiai and then being able to eat it and turn that energy back into the earth and allowing it to flourish and feed us back. So I'll close my presentation off with the mana'o okala or a piece of wisdom for the day. Huli kalima ilalo ola. To turn the hands down, there is life. Putting work into the ground, getting your hands in the lepo and the soil um, puts love and energy into the earth, which is able to feed us back. And that's um, something that I always keep within all the work that I do. So hello, mai. Looking forward to all of you folks coming to Oahu and meeting in person. Aloha piha. Mahalo. Uh, thank you so much. Uh you know, su super in inspirational. And, I, you know, I think bringing in the photos and your personal experiences, it it really, it carries a lot of weight. You know, oftentimes we're, we lecture and, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of, of droning on about theoretical things, but, uh, you know, I love to see what you, what you've been doing and uh, be great in, in the panel as well to bring in that perspective. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, so last but not least is Yoon Jung. Oh, can you share the slide, please? Yes, I was just gonna ask if you wanted me to do that. So let me do that. Okay, can you see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, so just let me know when you want to forward. Okay. Uh, so, uh, nice to meet you. I'm Yoon jung -an. I'm an assistant professor uh, at the Geography and Atmospheric Science Department at the University of Kansas. Uh, I wanted to start with my talk with my picture where, where I put myself together better and with an obnoxiously big my name on it. Next slide, please. So uh, throughout my career, education journey and professional career, I've been trained as a health and medical geographer and also a multidisciplinary researcher utilizing quantitative uh, methods. So right now I'm an assistant professor at, at Kansas. I was previously at CU Boulder as, an, as a postdoctor researcher and I got my PhD as a geographer and prior to that, I was working at a research institution in Korea, Korea Environment Institution, which is a um, government-funded research institution that I participated in several project, projects that developing climate change adaptation plans for South Korea. And during the time, I learned a lot about climate change and um, how, how uh, those climate change adaptation plans are um, related to uh, prevention of uh, climate-related disasters. And also during the, this time, I learned that some of the data from census, there are some limitations to reflect the real, real world or real life. So this uh, motivated me to pursue my PhD and my research is motivated, from, motivated a lot from this, this experience. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm a... I'm a teacher and a researcher at KU. So I teach method of ana analyzing ge geographical data, which is basically uh, intro to statistics. I teach them how to use R and some basic math and statistical analysis. And also I teach health and medical geography, which is a theory 
that are related to how to see environment and health and well-being in spatial context. And also I teach um, intro to GIS course. Um, during this course, uh, throughout this course, I teach students how to use data analysis and how to utilize to answer some of the questions that are related to environment and health. So I found this session very interesting. And um, I also looked at the module that you guys already developed and I was very excited because I feel like I can really incorporate that into my courses. So I'm very excited about this session. Uh, next slide. Uh, so a lot of my research is based on the social determinants of health, the theory. Uh, for those of you who are not might not be familiar with, I, if I explain it briefly, it's about like how social or environmental conditions can determine someone's uh, health and well-being. And for this um, theory, I'm trying to contribute more on this theory by incorporating some of the spatial context uh, to understand the spatial determinants of health. Uh, and this is also another part, big part of my research motivation. Next. Uh, next. So uh, there is still spatial, social spatial determinant of health is a big broad concept. So more specifically, I'm interested in climate. Um, a lot of my research have been focusing on extreme heat exposure and also built environment. I'm very interested in how housing conditions and housing um, structures are related to health and inequity. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> more specifically, I uh, am interested in exploring the physical and social and structural relationships with health and well-being. And to do, do this work, I realized that there are so many data that need to be built. For example, I uh, found that household, household level air conditioning ownership survey has been done uh, in 1980, and that was the most recent research as a national level. So I'm partner with a private company who has all the detailed information about housing structures and housing characteristics. So I built a air conditioning ownership map at census tract level for California. But right now I'm trying to build that data for the whole United States from 1970 to 2020. And I also recently published a work that illustrates the historical sediment data of the United States from 1910 to 2020. And also I'm working on a proposal that I would like to study more on the residents of uh, mobile homes and the location of mo building data for mobile home and manufactured home locations. And also um, working on some of the uh, research that are focusing on uh, heat, ex heat exposures on incarcerated population. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> so building on all these data sets, I would like to um, identify the areas that are most vulnerable uh, because of the built environment or socioeconomic characteristics and uh, suggest a way that we can uh, prioritize them to provide resources and things that they need. Uh, Next, please. And nowadays, I feel like everyone is a uh, text away or a Zoom call away, so or tweet away. So I hope we can connect through um, Twitter. Or if you're interested in learning more about my research, please use the QR code to access my Google Scholar. Thank you. Thank you, Yunjung. Uh, you know your your work is it's very impressive and very broad, and uh, you know. Glad that you're able to to be part of the panel. Uh, so so we are coming up just on the top of the hour, and I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, a couple of questions before we leave. I, you know, through through this conversation, it's just become apparent to me how much overlap we all have, and how much it would be good to to talk more. Uh, it, if we were to propose a dinner on the night after our panel. Uh, is that something folks would be interested in? And maybe it would give us a little bit more time to get to know each other. Okay, 
cool. Uh, so no pressure. I see some people shaking heads. So I, I think we'll go ahead and do that. And then again, no, no pressure if you have other commitments. Uh, the other thing is for this meeting that we've just held, uh, if, if you grant permission, we would create a Zenodo entry from this meeting and list all of us as co-authors, which again, then it's something that you can, you can point to as a citation. Uh, so is, is there anyone in feel free if you don't feel comfortable answering me right now, but you're, you're not comfortable with us posting it, please just send me an email to let me know or me or Linda or Greg. Um, uh, but if, if I don't have an email by Friday, then we'll go ahead and we'll post it and then we'll share with you guys the, the information. Uh, last thing is that, you know, the panel itself, uh, how, how we're imagining it is that, you know, each of you would have about a five minute block like we had now to, to introduce yourselves and your work. Uh, but then we would open up into to Q&A. Uh, you know, for, for our project, we're looking to figure out what are the best use cases that we can incorporate into the curriculum. Uh, so there'll definitely be some questions about that, you know, based on your research, are there any types of use cases that you might recommend to, to teach other people about health and air quality or environmental justice? But over the next few weeks, we'll also share with you a draft of other questions that we come up with so that it's, you know, you have time to prepare uh, for how to answer them. Is there any other questions or comments before we close the meeting? I just wanted to say that um, Camilla and Josie had to leave to catch the shuttle. So sorry, Yun Jung, that they had to leave during your presentation, but um, they, you know, enjoyed hearing everybody's presentations. Thanks, Linda. Uh, and, and thanks, everyone, again, for making the time today. You know, you, you'll be hearing from us by email as to prepare for the session. And again, if, if you're uncomfortable with us posting this online, uh, just send an email before Friday and we, we will refrain from posting it. All right. Thanks again. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Nice meeting you all. Bye-bye.